Hey y'all, welcome back to the lab. And in this video, we're reading Stop Vibe Coding, Start Power Coding, How to Write Quality Software Faster with Agentic AI Without Pissing Off Your Software Engineers. Now, vibe coding is the hottest thing to hit software this year. Everyone and their mother is using AI to build their own apps, AI wrappers, games, and personal tools. Vibe coding has made building software accessible to millions of people around the world without technical backgrounds, but it also means millions of pieces of software built without solid principles. Stories abound of major security issues and data breaches, AI wiping out days of work, and people bricking their systems because they don't understand how they work. Now, vibe coding has its problems, but I frequently see these problems blamed on the tools when I think they're more correctly blamed on how they're used. In this post, I'll present an alternative to vibe coding that allows engineers to leverage AI to write higher quality software faster, all while not pissing off your existing engineers. It pulls from decades of software engineering best practices and my own experience vibe coding with AI. That alternative is called power coding. Now, what is vibe coding? So vibe coding is typically using AI to code for you. You give it prompts and try to direct it to do what you want. The key distinction I'm making in this post is that the user is trying to get the AI to make things for them. It's a passive effort of tossing prompts at the AI and hoping something good comes out. The cycle being prompt check, prompt checked, prompt checked, etc. They check the outcome of the AI, but they skip the output the actual code and systems being built. So why does vibe coding fail? Vibe coding generally fails because it's a passive process. You're putting all your hopes and dreams for this piece onto the AI, but when's the last time you gave a sizable project to a random human with just a few sentences of instruction and got what you wanted out of it? Probably pretty rarely. This is kind of like walking up to someone random on the street and being like, draw me a picture of something. Whatever they give you back is probably going to be different than what you asked for just because of lack of context, not understanding what you want. Also, it's weird to walk up to someone randomly in the street. But for all these reasons, like you wouldn't really expect it of a human. And so it's kind of weird that we expect it of an AI. And so to solve for this, we kind of have to change how we're working with AI to get them to consistently give us good results. So now let's talk about some common routes to failure when vibe coding. Some of the like most common things that I see or reasons that people are vibe coding and it leads them to these bad outcomes. The first and most common is you just don't pri provide enough direction to the AI. The AI gives you what you asked for, but maybe not what you wanted. Poorly described features will lead the AI to outputting something that is technically correct, but not what you meant. Worse, if you don't understand the domain very well, you might think it's what you want, but it could be totally wrong or have large structural problems, which we'll talk about in a second. It's kind of like asking for a house. This could be a shed or a mansion or a Victorian or modern house, or it could be built with wood or metal or even house for birds or dogs and not humans. Without giving explicit instructions to the AI, any of these combinations is technically correct, but you probably had a specific one in mind and so it's not correct with regard to what you actually wanted out of it. Now the AIs cannot yet read minds and so you need to be very specific to get what you want. The second common path to failure is that you miss problems as you build. Small problems layered onto each other lead to big problems. It's kind of like, you know, if you start going in the direction from like Atlanta, let's say, um, to London, but then you're like three degrees off to the right, then by the time you get across the ocean, you're probably in Africa somewhere. Small problems compound over time. And so if you don't spot check and course correct regularly, it's very likely that you'll be layering in small bits of inaccuracy at each stage, which may end up bricking your system later. And this is usually what we call tech debt. In the worst case, this is like asking for a house, but you don't really know anything about houses. The AI might build something that kind of looks like a house, but underneath is just a facade. Think like a Disney World or a filming set where you got like the front of a house and it looks pretty real from one angle. But as soon as you go around the back, you're like, wait, this isn't a house. This is like a painting or just a wall or something. And if you don't know enough to at least be able to spot check it to like look behind the door and make sure it's real or like the windows actually work or, you know, there's actually something back there and really in software to actually test it so you can automate this thing, then it's very possible it would give you something that looks okay on the outside or at least at first glance, but doesn't actually solve the problem or purpose you had. An example of this is that AIs will sometimes use fake data to power the app. And so the app looks like it's doing what you wanted until you realize that the data itself isn't real or hooked up to anything. I saw a case of this like a week or two ago where the guy was trying to build some sort of vision thing that could look at Bluetooth signals through a wall. And he was so excited that he'd been able to get the AI to do this. 
and he had videos of it and everything and he put it online and people looked at the code and they were like, this isn't looking at even looking at Bluetooth signals. It's just a random noise that the AI has generated using like random packages to make it look real. And so the system kind of works on the surface, but like it's not using real data. So it actually, the whole principle is flawed and it doesn't make any sense. And this happens, I wouldn't say regularly, but the AI will sometimes do this if it's stuck or it doesn't know how to do something. It'll take the easy path, which is just generate fake data and kind of run with it. And so you have to be cognizant of this and kind of double check it. And that's the worst case. But a more common case is not that it gets the whole thing wrong, but that it's getting small things wrong that compound over time. In this scenario, it's more like it starts with the foundation of a house, but maybe the foundation isn't quite level or solid, or maybe it's just not the right size for what you're trying to build. Then it builds the structural components, but some of the support structure is the wrong size or the wrong material, or maybe it's not fastened together the right way. Then it might build the roof, but the angles are a little bit wrong. So rainwater would pull up and eventually leak. And so each one of these things in isolation might be okay, but when you actually put it into a structure, it starts to fail at its given purpose. And I think that this case is far more common. It's doing the right thing, but it's just making small mistakes as it goes. And if you don't know enough about the domain and or don't have the right testing structures in place to validate it, then it's very easy to go in the correct general direction with compounding problems. Some examples of this often include authentication issues where authentication exists, like it builds something that it says is authentication and maybe like it has a username and password page that you click but the authentication isn't actually being used to like block any of the pages. And so, you know, it got the general idea right of like authentication should exist, but it missed the whole point of it, which is to actually like protect the sensitive data from things. In other cases, you might finally get like your API or something up and running, but you know, it built it in such a way that it's good for just one use case, but maybe you had a grander vision of what this you know, things should look like. And now it's extremely hard to actually build another feature because it's so coupled to the first description that you gave it, that it's really hard to change. And so basically if too many of these problems compound, you may end up bricking your system, requiring a costly rewrite. Bricking in that maybe it's broken or maybe it's in a working condition, but um, you, you just can't change it at all. So therefore it's kind of limited in what, what its usefulness is. But more likely you'll just have a bunch of bugs reported to you and maybe a few security reports if they're nice. Um, I think people generally think the internet is nice, but really the internet's kind of the wild, wild west. People are always constantly trying to hack each other. And so if you get like a nice person on Twitter who sees your launch post, they might send you a DM and be like, oh, there's like a little security problem. But um, often cases, people aren't gonna do that. They're just gonna hack your system. If you have, if you're an AI wrapper, they'll hack your system and then basically use the AI through your system so they don't have to pay for it. Um, or they just might, you know, put trash data in your database um, if they're just like, you know, trying to prank you or something. But generally these problems can get super costly. And this is one of the, like the big reasons why you see those people posting. That's like, I spun up my first app and now I have a $10,000 bill on, on Google Cloud. So it really is pretty important to cross your T's and dot your I's when it comes to things like security and make sure that the AI is kind of doing something reasonably for you. And the third big path to failure is that you just don't build knowledge about your system. Because you're not hands-on with the system, you don't build up knowledge about how the system is actually built. Because you don't understand the system, you can't help out the AI when it gets stuck. And this means when a problem does happen, and it will happen, you are left with a costly debugging session as you must first try to understand a system that is totally foreign to you, even though you're the one that vibe coded it. This is like building one of the, those houses with the bad foundations, and the house is now slowly starting to shift. Had you been collaborating with AI, you'd understand that shifting is likely a structural or foundational problem. But without that, you'd have to search through the whole house and probably even call in an expert to figure it out, which is very expensive. And this is probably the most insidious problem with vibe coding because it leaves you totally helpless when problems do occur. And if you can't fix it, you may have to scrap the whole project anyway. And this is what's happened to many vibe coders when they didn't implement authentication correctly. Internet people found the security holes and started pounding the service with fake data or using its services without paying. At some point, they either had to call in an expert to fix it or trash the project altogether to stop the bleeding. And again, this is like one of the most common reasons why, you know, vibe coders ship their project and they end up with like $10,000 worth of um, cloud charges is just because they left the door open and they didn't even realize that they were doing that because they didn't understand the project that they were building. Okay, so that's like the main problems I see with vibe coding, the common patterns that lead to um, a lot of these big problems that we see. And let's talk about how can we code with AI better. And this is where we talk about power coding. The analogy we're using is that AI is kind of like a power tool. It can vastly improve your process when wielded strategically, but when wielded poorly can lead to many of the same mistakes that manual coding would. So power coding is using the AI like a power tool. 
Use it to enhance your process, not outsource the whole thing. And I want to make it clear that this is a hands-on approach, not a hands-off approach. It pulls from decades of best practices from software engineering, how to make software changes that produce business impact quickly and safely. We don't really want to move fast and break things here. We really want to move fast with stable infrastructure. And so the first principle of this is to plan your project and features beforehand. Plan your project before you begin coding. What is the expected outcome? What steps are there going to be? What context does the AI need to know? Do you have a specific library that you want to use? Are there specific styles that you like coding in? Is this going to be hit via like a web API or is this going to be a CLI tool or is this a game? Just be specific about it. And to be specific about what you want, you're going to have to plan up front and understand yourself what you want. Leverage things like agents files and documentation to help the AI understand your code base, best practices and expected steps like testing. If you don't tell the AI this, sometimes it will just skip testing. And this is an easy way to, you know, go multiple prompts without understanding that your whole thing is actually broken. And the general rule here is that you want to provide all information you would to a new engineer. What helps engineers code better is often what helps AIs code better as well. And so I think this is a good practice for basically all product people to get into. Then provide good descriptions for the AI for each task. Point out to it, like, what files do you want changed? Point out to it, you know, where the documentation is and stuff to make sure that it's reading that. All of this together helps the AI one-shot your asks, which decreases rework and increases throughput. And a large portion of this is just because you did the, the pre-work to plan what you actually wanted so you could give the AI all this context. The next principle is to build one small feature at a time. By building one feature at a time, we can be more of a hands-on collaborator than a hands-off manager helps us avoid many of the issues with being hands-off. And so basically the cycle of this is just going to be describe the feature you want, you know, pulling from the plan that you've already built, review it when the AI builds the code, and then you commit it if you're okay with it. And if not, you change it before committing it. And so this allows you to increase the chance of one shots because you're giving those good descriptions and really one shots is like the golden ideal outcome. It's how you're going to get the best throughput with these systems. You're also going to be able to catch problems early and often because the amount of code that it's doing is going to be small and it's only going to be accomplishing a simple single task. And so you can very easily check its work um, without having to dig through like thousands of lines of code. And then you're going to minimize the amount of rework required when you do find a problem because instead of reverting, let's say, hours of work because you've been prompting, 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 and now you don't have a good checkpoint to come back to, you can now just say, oh, let's just go back to the last thing, which you know will just be the latest feature and you've been committing the whole time when you're okay with it. And so you'll come back to a stable place um, from which to build off of again. And really this is similar to how most effective software engineering teams work. They do one specific task at a time. They put it up for review and make changes if necessary. And then they commit it to the code base to maintain forward progress. Very few software engineering teams are building like a whole day's worth of work and then trying to ship that all at once because that just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't really do well over time. Breaking up your things into actually bite-sized pieces gives us more confidence that this change actually does what we wanted it to do. It doesn't have side effects um, and helps us review it faster so that we can get it out to prod. Now, I've personally found that atomic commits and stack PRs work very well for this cycle. I also think they work incredibly well for general software engineering cycles. I think everyone should be using these. And it's double useful because it provides those get native checkpoints. So it's easier to roll back if you need to. Um, I see so many people have problems with checkpointing and it's like so weird because the whole point of version control is to provide checkpoints. And so if you just use atomic commits, use get and version control as it's supposed to, you'll have checkpoints that work both for AI, but also work for deploying things as well. Now I currently use the Graphite VS Code extension for managing my stacks, but there's like plenty of other tools out there like Gittown and Jujutsu and plenty of other ones. So I think if you're new to coding, maybe just start with Git. Um, but if you have been coding for a while and you want something that actually helps with longer stacks, I um, would highly recommend any of these tools. The final thing you should be doing is you need to be understanding your system as you build it. By planning your project and features beforehand and being an active collaborator as you build, you'll be building knowledge about how your system works and the principles it's built on. This doesn't necessarily mean you'll be able to unstick the AI whenever it gets stuck, but it will give you a much better chance of doing so. Plus, this knowledge will lead to additional ideas and questions about your code base, the technology you're using, and your process. This can lead to new feature ideas or ways to make it faster or better or ways to improve your process as you work with AI. And over time, this builds core knowledge that will help improve your current and future projects. 
This knowledge will be crucial in improving as a collaborator for AI, providing more meaningful reviews, having better ideas of what to build in the first place, and steering it in better directions. Maybe you saw what the AI did with authentication and you're curious if that's the best practice or not. So you look it up and now you're equipped with best practices for both your current and future implementations. Or maybe you're curious about the best way to build web APIs so you can see if there's any obvious improvements you can make in your own project. Now you know what good web APIs look like and you can update your implementation and have a good framework for future implementations as well. Don't let AI get all the learnings from building this project. Work on yourself as you go. The whole idea of AI is that it makes us more efficient, freeing up more time for manual work. Don't waste that extra time doing rework, spend it on more strategic, forward-looking thinking. Next. Now, AI is here to stay and will likely get much better in the coming months and years. As they say, this is the worst it will ever be, and at this point, I believe them. The pragmatic strategy is not to ignore it, but to figure out how to leverage it to improve your own craft. Power coding strikes a nice balance of getting big efficiency wins from AI today, while avoiding many of the common pitfalls people are running into with vibe coding. Plus, I think it feels better as a software engineer. Less, you know, let the AI go build everything for you, which is often leading to comically bad outputs and all of these security incidents and data breaches and stuff like that, which it honestly is company killing if it happens at the wrong time. And it's more about leveraging the AI to help you build more effectively. And I think when it works well, it really does feel a bit like magic, especially when you start using it for like things that you didn't want to code anyway, like building a big test suite or writing a bunch of XML comments or fixing some dumb bugs like the ordering of inputs to make them alphabetical or something like that. All of these things are like definitely force multipliers because you're spending less of your time on things that aren't very high impact, but are kind of required to do the things that are high impact and more of your time planning and, and making better use of um, your skills. Now, if you like this post, you might also like I vibe coded a C-sharp library with Claude code and here's six things I learned. You might also be interested in introducing Cinderblock HTML, C-sharp DSL for building HTML with composable building blocks. This is the C-sharp library that I built basically all with power coding. And finally, my 2025 job search as a software engineer, results, timelines, and how I study for interviews. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.